Hello and welcome back to Rewildology, the podcast that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I am your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. I want you all to take a moment and think about the country Italy. What are the first five images that come to mind? I'm sure many of you thought of Paris, Rome, the Eiffel Tower, delectable wine, incredible cuisine, and a long, rich human history to name a few. Probably the last thing you thought about was a thriving population of apex predators. Uh, Brooke, so what? Yes, you heard me right. Italy is home to thousands of wolves. Beach here, mega metropolis there, and wolves everywhere in between. (laughs) Italy isn't the only European country with a thriving wolf population. And as with every human predator story, living with wolves isn't without conflict. To teach us all about Europe's wolves, today we are sitting down with Valeria Salvatori, PhD, European wolf expert. Valeria knew from the moment she met her mentor, Professor Boyatani, that she wanted to study and work in wildlife management. During university, she performed research in remote parts of the Andean Mountains to understand Chilean fox behavior and continued on projects in the Masai Mara and Netherlands. But as time went on, she missed her family and home and reconnected with her mentor, Professor Boyatani, to side on a PhD project closer to Italy. This is when wolves entered her life. For her PhD, Valeria studied wolves in the Carpathian Mountains of Eastern Europe and has worked with wolves and their human counterparts ever since. Valeria and I have a marvelous time discussing her journey that led from studying predators across the globe to focusing on wolves closer to her Italian home, the history of the wolf across Europe, management of wolves in many countries across the continent, how she brought together all stakeholders to make a wolf management plan, issues with politics, and what she hopes to see in the future for wolves across Europe. All right, everyone, please enjoy this thought-provoking conversation with Valeria. Well, hi, Valeria. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today and talking about a very special species that a lot of people might not know much about when it comes to this particular part of the world. So before we dive into all of that, though, you have one of the most incredible life stories. When you started to tell me all of the different avenues that your life has gone down before you got to what you're doing today. I just, I was mind blown. So please just take it. Let's, let's go on a journey through time. Take us back to maybe college or even younger. When did you know that you wanted to work with wildlife and what is the story that led you to what you're doing? Hi Brooke. Hi. Uh, Well, it's, it's a pleasure really to talk to you and to tell you a little bit of my story. Um, I, when I was a kid, I knew I loved animals, but I think I didn't imagine I would have ended up working with wolves and particularly with the relationship that wolves have with people. Um, I remember when I was at university, there were a few things that interested me, but uh, the last year of, uh, of classes, I had a class with Professor Boitani, and that's where I really knew what I wanted to do. Professor Boitani took us on a journey to essentially to United States, you know, on a journey, on, a, on an imaginary uh, journey through our studies and through our books. To United States and the approach that, they, that biologists in the United States had on wildlife management. And that's when I thought that's, that is really what I would like to do. So, yeah, I was in my early 20s and I decided that I would have loved to work in wildlife management. So since then, immediately after the course, with a colleague of mine, we applied to be as volunteers in many different projects all around the world. We wrote, I remember at that time, we didn't have email. So we wrote letters, (laughs) like tens of letters 
to biologists that were running field projects all around the world. And we received two replies, one from Chile in South America and one from Nepal. And both of them were very exciting. The one from Nepal was more exciting, though, because it was, <laughs> you know, on a project working with, with bears. But this didn't continue. So we only had one reply and then we sent a letter back and they never replied to us. The one for the project in Chile went through and we actually spent three months in Chile for that first time. And that was an amazing, amazing adventure. After Chile, we went to Ecuador to visit another field project in in the tropical forest. You know, it was all for a young student. It was like opening a window on the real world, you know, visiting scientists that were doing exactly what you're dreaming to do. That was really, really nice. And then we came back and we proposed Luigi Boitani to do our um, the graduation thesis on the Chilean foxes, because in this area where we went as students, we, we were trapping small mammals. They were doing a long-term studies, uh, study on population dynamics of small mammals. And there were some foxes that they had collared, but had no time to study and to follow up with the with the radio colors. So we proposed we could do that. And and yes, they agreed, but we didn't have we didn't have money to go back and we did need a car, you know, to follow the foxes and stay there. So we started looking for sponsors. And that was the year where, you know, I learned a lot about project proposals, how to persuade people that what you're doing is worth. And and actually we succeeded. Yeah, we, we got the support of both Nissan Chile and Shell Chile that paid for our car and the petrol. And, and we got a scholarship from the um, Lincoln Park Zoo. So we, we were ready to go. And we spent the most amazing year of my life, you know, in a national park, completely remote. It was 400 kilometers north of Santiago de Chile. And we stayed in a small house with no electricity. And only the only running water we had was, you know, pumping water from a well with a pump. And I think it was not only extremely enriching from the point of view of, of the field work and the professional life that I was living because we had to build the project on our own and, you know, make turns, assign responsibilities and solve problems. But also from the life point of view, living in such a remote place, we shared a house with a group of local scientists who came for their field activities one week every month and we helped them we participated in their activities and it was all incredibly enriching really mm -hmm. you know sharing not only professional issues matters but also our everyday life it was really nice and i came back I remember when I came back after these 30 months, I live in Rome and I thought, no, my God, this is, this is not possible. You know, living in such a large city after 13 months of no pollution, hmm. no traffic, <laughs> no nothing. Well, it was hard to get used again to living in an urban environment. And uh, yeah, I really, really enjoyed that. So why did you leave? Yes, yeah, so like, what's the story? Like, I mean, that that sounds like that was almost impossible to leave. Did you go back yeah. to Europe, like officially, <laughs> or were you like, oh my gosh, book me another flight? Let's get back out of here. It was certainly the place to be, but it was also very remote. Uh, I missed my family. I remember writing letters, you know, and going out of the park once a month to just call family and friends. I had a boyfriend at the time, 
And uh, yes, I wanted to come back and I thought this is the life I would like to live, but in a place that would be more closer to, to home, mm. so Europe. Africa is also closer to, to <laughs> <Yeah>. Italy. <laughs> So when I came back, I um, prepared my thesis, my dissertation. I gave my dissertation and then I, um, I went to Spain again as a volunteer in Doñana National Park, which is also an incredible place. And I stayed there three months uh, and I enjoyed that experience again very much. That is another beautiful place. It is incredible how enriching these places are. You know, those places where different studies engage biologists in different fields. And then in the evening, we all meet. We all met for a drink at a bar, you know, exchanging uh, what we had seen during the day, brainstorming over, you know, major questions and issues in the fields of biology. It was really, really nice. Another very nice experience. And then I started applying for scholarships because I really wanted to to go around and, and visit the world. So I had a scholarship to go and stay six months in, uh, in a, a research institute in the Netherlands. And, and with them, it was a very international institution, the ITC. And, and with them, we, we set up a, a small project in, in Kenya. Uh, so we went to Masai Mara Natural Reserve. Mm. And that was another very good experience. From Masai Mara, I then, when my scholarship in the Netherlands finished, I had another scholarship to do a master's course in the UK at University of Southampton. There, I started gaining experience in the field of remote sensing and satellite imagery analysis. I started doing this in in the Netherlands as well. And in Southampton, I ended up doing my master's thesis using satellite imagery for assessing deforestation in tropical forests. So I specialized in remote sensing and GIS. And when I got offered a scholarship for a PhD, I set up a project for um, evaluating suitable habitat for large carnivores in the Carpathian Mountains in Eastern Europe. And that was another amazing experience I had, traveling through Romania, Ukraine, Poland and Slovakia and meeting all the people that had any direct or indirect experience, hunters, livestock breeders, um, scientists that were studying bears, wolves and lynx in those mountains that had an incredible story, you know, cultural history, very diverse from country to country, but still very enriching. And I met people that helped me everywhere. Hmm. That was really something I, I have to acknowledge you know, I was alone going through these countries. I even bought a Land Rover to do this, this field trip. But I always had someone in each country I visited, I had someone to wait for me. And with, with him or her, trying to organize field trips, field visits, interviews to hunters and foresters and, and livestock owners. And it was really, really another incredible experience I had. Wow. So why the wolf then? It sounds like you could have chosen multiple different topics for your PhD, but you specifically chose large carnivores and a, one of which is the wolf in that. Why? What drew you to this group of animals in this particular region of Europe? What's the story there? Yeah, well, the wolf was because of the contacts that I kept with Professor Boitani, who always studied wolves in Italy. And he's also the chair of the Large Carnivore Initiative for Europe that existed already at that time. So, you know, when I was offered the uh, PhD scholarship, I, I contacted him and, and asked the possibility to do a project with him, possibly on large carnivores. And he suggested, you know, to focus on, on the Carpathian Mountains that was very poorly known 
territory and Romania uh, was not part of the European Union yet. Slovakia and Poland either, I think, or were just joined. I can't remember. It was the late 90s. So he was, let's say again, you know, the, the inspiring person and, and the bridge I could walk, you know, towards this field that, that then took part of my life and has never left since then. Yeah, they've definitely been a part of your story since. So before we dive into more of your work and the amazing human dimension that you've really cultivated and an expert on, let's first, if you wouldn't mind, let's go through the history of the wolf in the area. So yeah, like let, let's let's explore that a little bit. Could you take just take us through uh, maybe like a chronological order timeline of what the wolf has gone through up until today, and then we can start to dive into more of their management and the human element of this. But yeah, for for context, what has the wolf gone through? <laughs> The wolf um, occupies a special place in our mind. If you consider. You know, think about when we were, since we are kids, we we have this idea of the big bad wolf. It holds a special place in our culture, in our um, uh, Occidental culture, which is strongly dominated by Catholic elements. And in Catholicism, symboli- symbolicity, the wolf represents the bad. For those Uh, who listen and who have children, they might get surprised or they might have noticed, because I did when I got my children, I didn't realize it before, that in most films, uh, cartoons and books for children, wolves are not only represented as bad, but also stupid. Hmm. They are usually greedy, and not really clever and bad by nature. Yet they are an incredible species. You know, they have a family. They have some incredible rules that somehow are similar to to our family rules. You know, whereby the only uh, alpha couple reproduce and they have a, a territory that the family defend and, and when the young become sexually mature, they need to leave home, just as our teenagers do. <laughs> you know, they, they start breaking the rules. <laughs> and if, uh, if they're not suited anymore to be at home, then they need to be let go. <laughs> <laughs> so for this reason, you know, the, the place that wolves hold in our culture is also very much uh, related. Uh, it, it has very much affected the history of wolf in nature. It has been a bad uh, element to contrast since the Romans. Romans time, we have some written testimonies of the use of dogs to guard livestock against the wolf. And then wolves were killed systematically just to protect essentially our livestock. And so much so that bounties were paid to get rid of wolves in ancient times. Then at the beginning of the um, last century, I think wolves in Europe were already more or less healthy, in healthy state. And when urbanization uh, started and increased, uh, it's population started to going down because essentially humans invaded its space, both uh, through deforestation and the use of, uh, of land for urbanization. So in Italy, for example, the minimum of the wolf population was reached at the beginning of the 1970s. And in those years, the species was declared as protected species. And this happened in many other countries in Europe where wolves were decreased in their population and and they were declared a protected species. Most 
countries, though, when entered the European Union, then had to um, implement the Habitat Directives, and that was in the early 90s. The Habitat Directives included the wolf in the, the Annex 4, so the list of protected species, animal species, and, and that was the beginning, I think, of the process that took back the wolf in most of the European landscapes that we see now. Wolves in Europe are now present in a lot of countries where uh, they were absent for nearly 50 years. We wow. see wolves in Belgium, in the Netherlands. They have come back in Germany for the last 12 years at a very rapid pace. They have recolonized most of the uh, Italian territory. We have now wolves uh, all throughout the uh, peninsula uh, Italy and still in the colonization process of the Alps. We have wolves in Switzerland and we have wolves, uh, you know, from Portugal to essentially all across uh, Eastern Europe. There are countries where wolves have never disappeared. Romania is one of them, Poland, Ukraine and Russia. And in these countries, the, their populations are still, you know, quite doing quite well. Poland, not so much, but it's still increasing, it's, it's recovering. I think we can now say that in most European countries, wolf is near threatened, you know, it's not, it's still to be considered a protected species, but not in danger anymore. I think it, it has gone through a very strong recovery process and uh, and it has made it. We still have some few wolves in the Scandinavian countries where, you know, other interests are very strong. In many countries, the return of the wolf has triggered a lot of reactions. I don't know why. Well, in a certain sense, yes, we know why. And we have said it before, you know, because of the history of the cultural history of the wolf, the presence of the wolf um, is associated to extreme reactions. Either you love it or you hate it. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and this is reflected also in the social movements that people give towards these species. Whenever there is a public event on wolves, there are a lot of people that show up and some of them are strongly against the wolf and some of them just love it, you know, and, and, and want it to be there just for the sake of knowing that he, it's there. Um, so I, after my PhD, where I never saw a wolf in the Carpathia Mountains. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> That's yeah, ironic. I never saw a wolf there. <laughs> I saw wolves in the Apennines in a national park, but I had to go there, you know, and, and uh, stay in a, in a very remote area where I knew there were wolves with, it, with some colleagues of mine. We climbed up at sunset and yet they appeared. It was an experience that I would never forget. You know, I did that when I was a student. But I very rarely uh, saw wolves. You know, I saw tracks. I saw scats, you know, feces when I go and, and do some monitoring activities. But seeing wolves is an event that... I only rarely lived. And what I usually experience is the reaction of people who see them or who experience the vicinity of wolves. And that I found very interesting. I love uh, exploring how people feel just by knowing that wolves are out there. Uh, some people now are used to have photo traps, camera traps, and they are thrilled, you know, to see that wolves are around their houses uh, or uh, livestock owners that you teach how to use camera traps and they go out and they set up their camera traps and they are, and they know that, yes, our wolves are out there. Uh, or it's, it's very, very interesting to talk to people and, and also facilitate the interactions between 
people that have these different reactions. This is what I'm doing now. Yes. Oh, I can't wait to get most of our conversation is going to be on that human dimension and how you've entered your way into that in a way that just blows my mind. And b- before that, I think just for context for all of us listening, especially if anybody knows about Yellowstone wolves, those were reintroduced. I live in a state where wolves are going to be reintroduced. Now, when it comes to Europe, was it a natural expansion? That, that the wolf did, and so there wasn't that, like, oh, big governments coming in and reintroducing wolves? Or uh, or did, was it that, where there were actual reintroduction projects, or has it been mostly passive? Just for context, how are the wolves getting across Europe? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a clarification that needs to be made. Uh, the only ever reintroduction of wolves that was made in the world was the one you are referring to in Yellowstone. That is the only one reintroduction that has ever made. All the other expansions and return and and comeback were processes that occurred naturally just because of the capacity of the wolf to adapt to new scenarios, to grab new opportunities. We see wolves now crossing cities, crossing roads in the Netherlands. We see wolves walking in the beaches of Italy. That's crazy. We see wolves, (laughs) uh, you know, trotting across wine yards in the hills of Tuscany. It's amazing. We, we, We really see them. We see them eating invasive species in the Po Valley. <laughs> so it's it's really an incredible animal that can adapt to to the opportunities that appear. And and this has made him able to expand on its own. In in Europe there have been no reintroduction whatsoever. Mm, I'm so glad that you clarified that because I think that also helps set up the politics behind this as well is because anyone who knows anything about the Yellowstone wolves will know about the insane amount of conflict and the almost like big brother government representation that they have. It's it's almost a little bit about the wolves anymore when it comes to the United States. So for context, when we now, I would love to start getting to the human dimension now. So as we translate over to the areas you've worked in, maybe it might even make sense to go back to your PhD. And what were your views of the wolf and maybe the human dimension part of this and how did that shift when you started to get into your work and talk to all the stakeholders and on that how did you even talk to them like how did you get farmers and and ranchers and like all these people to talk to you about this so yeah maybe just start taking us through the human journey of this and what you've learned i have learned how to be as neutral as as more neutral as possible since I was a little kid, you know, when because because of life history, <laughs> when my parents got divorced, I struggled to create occasions for getting all together again because I wanted my family to come back together. So I really, you know, I was a, a sort of a mediator sometimes. And now that I mediate these meetings with the different stakeholders, I thought, oh my gosh, this this comes back, you know, from when I was a little girl and I tried to mediate from different parts of my family. So I think I developed this this ability to be neutral, and then I I then since then studied a little bit of sociology, you know, from my PhD. I didn't take a course, but I loved studying some books on sociology, and um, and what I always tried to do is to hold a neutral a neutral position. I always tried not to be, you know, for the wolf or against the wolf. I was talking to hunters and trying to be sympathetic, you know, trying to value what they're, they were telling me because they hold an incredible knowledge. 
They know the areas that they uh, used to walk through when hunting. They know wildlife. And it was an amazing adventure to talk to them, you know, to sit at 11 o'clock in the morning after driving, uh, you know, through the mountains and sit at someone's place who offered me some vodka or something like that. <laughs> at 11 in the morning, that's which, awesome. <laughs> Yeah, which you can't possibly refuse right. and start talking about their experience, you know, listening to that time when they uh, saw a wolf or when they uh, were able to see the den of a bear or, or, or a lynx or they, they saw some lynx pups. So every, uh, every time that I was listening to one such experience was just amazing. It was just entering the life of someone who was sharing uh, a very intimate part of an experience that he or she had lived. It was mostly talking with men, I have to say. But but yes, it was really, you know, the 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 ability to to immediately feel as as if you were sharing the same uh, the same environment. So the ability to be to to feel empathy for the people. I mean, even when I entered the, the place of people that had bare skin hung on the wall, you know, I, I never expressed my disagreement because I, I was respecting the fact that they were welcoming me. Hmm. I was asking uh, information and, and they were accepting to provide some part of their knowledge. And I think that was what I was valuing the the, the fact that they were sharing with me part of their life. So since uh, from then, I always, of course, when I when I started my PhD, but also my my graduation thesis, I I loved animals. You know, I I was interested in protecting wildlife, and I thought that only you know through limiting human activities, then wildlife could make a comeback. But I think. Some 30 years ago, it was even easier to imagine divide, you know, uh, between wildlife and human places or anthropo anthropized areas. Nowadays, in Europe at least, it is virtually impossible to, to imagine such divide. The wildlife and the human activities have interspersed so much you know, we are nearly one matrix. There is very little space that is devoted to wild nature where human activities are banned. So the interactions between humans and wildlife is somehow needed and unavoidable. Uh, and this is, you know, what really thrilled me sometimes, you know, to see how People in some places are so used. I, I was listening to an interview a few weeks ago about a teacher that was struggling to get to her class because she had to travel through the mountains with high snow. And, you know, they were interviewing the, the schools, the school children and the teacher. And one of the things that they mentioned, I said, yes, we have to face so many elements in, in order to reach homes, uh, to reach schools. Sometimes we have to leave home some two or three uh, hours before because uh, there is no, but there are also uh, deer on the street, there are bears and uh, there are wolves that cross the street. And yes, <laughs> well, what is this? Uh, and that was, you know, the Abruzzi National Park in the Central Apenna in, in Italy, where where you have also Rome and Milan, which are big cities where you you don't even imagine that this can happen. Yet there are people who are used to live with wildlife in their everyday life, and their lives are incredibly different from ours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so uh, along your journey, from our last conversation, it sounded like you were actually able to make meetings of all these stakeholders to come together and talk about the wolf 
and uh, and a way to move forward. So how did you get those to happen? Like who, who were the participants that showed up to these? I'm sure you invited as many different stakeholders as possible, but who actually came and then how, how did it go? Was there a transition from the beginning to the end of these meetings? And, and yeah, I would, yeah, explore those with you. Yeah, that was part of, um, of a project that I led in, in, uh, in central Italy. We started thinking of a project for um, providing support to farmers, to livestock owners, that had to um, protect their sheep against wolf attacks. So we engaged in a collaboration process with the agricultural unions and some farmers. And then I, I really get to know and to understand, you know, the life of farmers and the life of, of livestock breeders who can't afford, you know, taking one single day off their mm. job because the animals are there and they need to eat every day and they need to be milked and they need to be looked after. They are, you know, some of them are, are very amazing people. <clears throat> and they, their job is actually the one that grants us some high quality food that I at least don't want to give up. So during the project, we used to hold meetings with the different groups, you know, who were present in the area uh, with environmentalists or with hunters or with livestock breeders, you know, isolated meetings just to tell them what we were doing and then call the hunters and say, would you help us doing some monitoring activities? And then to the environmentalists, would you help us doing some communication activities? And then the livestock breeders, would you, you know, help us setting up some some fences for, for your livestock and check, test how they're effective and so on and we realized then uh, that whenever we talked isolated with a single group everything was okay for them but yet in the newspapers we we read of strong uh, disagreement you know whenever a wolf attack happened to livestock then there was this expression of anger and frustration that we thought there must be something going on here that we can't really catch. So we suggested the provincial administration that we gather all these groups together and make them talk, and facilitate <laughs> the dialogue you know, between them. And I remember the officer was really skeptical. She said, are you sure you want to do this? It might be really, you know, resource consuming and, and you might get in the middle of a dispute. Do you want to do this? I said, well, we, we, we have to try. And we, we tried that and we succeeded. It was amazing how interesting the exchanges between people were the ability of people to go beyond their preconception and the openness that they were able to show towards each other. We started that process with a project funded by the European Commission and we went along for three years. And it is amazing how uh, some people got friends you know, they uh -huh. make friends, <clears throat> an animal rights activist sitting next to a hunter and listening to each other, trying to understand that a livestock owner is not a slaughter. He or she loves their animal, they look after the animals, and they are so passionate about the work that they do, the quality of the cheese that they make, that is you know, such an enriching experience that you really then get attached to these people and you never want to let them go. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we organized this series of meetings with the same people. It was a group of 20 to 30 people with the help of a 
super facilitator, you know, would never suggest anyone to do such such an experience without a facilitator because facilitators know exactly uh, when to step in, how to interrupt a lively discussion and how to make sense of a lively discussion. It is amazing the ability that these professionals have to bring about the positive from what can appear as a dispute. So we made uh, the series of meetings and we pushed the participants to make some incredible experiences. You know, we asked them to put their feet in the shoes of others, like on livestock breeders, we asked them to act as an animal rights activist. Okay, now you are an animal rights activist. Please tell us your interest. And please tell us why you don't like livestock breeders. And the way around, you know, right. to an animal rights activist, you say, okay, now pretend that you are a hunter and tell us what are your interests and why you don't like animal rights activists. And it was so enriching, you know, so it was an opportunity to deeply understand what were the values of each other. And everybody was there because everybody had the same interest. They were deeply rooted in the environment, in the territory they belong to, and they wanted the landscape to remain the same. They loved the landscape they lived in and they wanted it to be so in the future. And in order it to be so in the future, there were the need to, to have the livestock owners and the wolf in the same place. <laughs> so yeah it, it was really really nice and the group was able to join forces in a collaborative manner and to elaborate a, a series of proposals for actions that could be done to improve the situation you know for the livestock breeders and for the wolf and for the community so it was really an amazing experience that we have gone through. But unfortunately, the, the local government has not been able to uh, take advantage of that. So, uh, you know, sometimes I think, OK, I think we have opened a window over the future and now we have to close it because reality is somehow different because, you know, the politicians don't really like to do what are the interests of the majority. They, they just like to do what are the interests of the ones that shout the louder. We are still working. And I think this is uh, a process that uh, is still going on. I, I, and I think that the people that have gone through that experience will never forget it. Right. I will never forget it. And some of them tell me, you know, I would never forget the experience and reaching process that I have gone through. I think that on a social and, an, and from a personal point of view, this experience has been extremely enriching for everybody. I'd say just going through that and listening to it, I would have died to have been a fly on the wall in those <laughs> meetings just to hear all the different stakeholders. And that is just something I talk about in almost every single episode of this podcast, how vital it is to listen to every voice when it comes to wildlife management. And just like you said, sometimes it's unfortunate when politicians in the government doesn't listen to these, it sounds like really great solutions and proposals that were made from the people, the mass majority of people that actually interact with wolves in every single way, shape and form, whether it's livestock breeders and everything else. So I, I think my next natural question then is how are wolves managed then? And I'm assuming Actually, I don't know. Were these meetings and proposals in Italy? And so if we use Italy as a management example, how are wolves managed? And is it on like a conflict basis? Or what exactly is going on from a political level when it comes to Italian wolves? The project that we, we did with these participatory processes um, was implemented in different places. 
in Spain, in Italy, in Romania. It is now ongoing in Sweden, in France, uh, and in Germany. And wow. of, of course, in each place, because it's very heavily dependent on the people that come to these meetings. Uh, in every place, we, uh, we have to adapt and to do something different, and, and the outcomes are different. But I can tell you from Spain and Italy, we have some similarities. Um, so wolves, both in Spain and in Italy, are protected. They are protected species, both at national and international level. We, as member of the European Union, we should have a management plan for each protected species. In Italy, we don't have a management plan for wolves. We are still debating a draft that has been prepared in 2015. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Seven years <laughs> later. <approved>. Yes. <laughs> In, uh, in Spain, there are, because it's a federal state, we have uh, different uh, management plans for each autonomous regions. How it is managed? Um, Italy, I think it's one of the few countries in Europe where the killing of wolf is still seen as something, you know, a barrier to be overcome. Um, kill, legal killing. I'm, I'm talking about legal killing of wolves. According to the European Commission uh, Habitat Directives, protected species mm, may not be killed, but derogations can be applied in certain circumstances, such as, you know, when the animals causes a danger to human safety or where the animals cause very high level of damage to properties. Now, this very high level of damage to properties is free for interpretation. Mm. Each country interprets these very high level of damage in a different manner. So in the majority of European countries, the derogations to street protection are used to legally kill wolves that repeatedly attack livestock. Now, as a biologist, I question myself, how can a, you know, a government prove that this wolf that they have killed is a wolf that has caused a very high level of damage. And this is key of, of the application of the derogation. And this is essentially the reason why in Italy uh, it has never been applied. In different countries, the interpretation is, is different. You know, some countries remove the whole pack. Oh, wow. Because of course, yeah, because of course you cannot remove the single animals. Or they have a strict monitoring system whereby they can identify the individual or at least, you know, the pack the individual belongs to. So they might kill a brother or a sister of that wolf. In Italy, this has never been done. In some countries, there are some... Let's say quotas, although the strict uh, interpretation of, of the derogations don't really allow for quotas. In Sweden, for example, there is uh, what is called preventive hunting. So when, when there is the likelihood that a wolf might attack some livestock, then there is a possibility to ask for a license to apply a protective hunting shot. Which is debatable. <laughs> <It's> yeah, very... <laughs> we could go down that rabbit hole, it's but very <laughs> in Italy, it has never been applied. We have gone through um, a long period of uh, strict protection since the seventies, when the wolf were very few, uh, strictly protected. Most of the people saw it as a very fragile and threatened uh, species, and nowadays it's even difficult to let the idea go through that it's not a fragile species anymore. It's not in danger of extinction anymore. It's doing pretty well. It's, it's recovered. It could afford some legal killing. If this could be useful for something, and now this is the other question that, that you know, we pose when, when we want to apply derogations. Is it useful to kill some wolves 
Uh, in 2015, when we drafted the, the latest version of the wolf management plan in Italy, we thought, okay, let's open for some killing because otherwise the farmers get this perception that their animals, yes, can be killed by the, the wolf, but wolf is untouchable. And this is not true, you know, the wolf can sustain some killing and that might give the sense of inequality a little bit, you know, less power. So let's open for this. And that opened a huge debate that made the management plan not to be approved until now. So this is an example of how powerful the debate about wolf killing is in Italy. Strict protection by the law, livestock breeders that get animals killed should be compensated for losses. This is more or less the same in all European countries. Compensation is one of the tools for wolf management, and it is a tool that was adopted during the early 90s to share the economic loss that was suffered by a single livestock owner. Let's share it among the society. So the society, through their taxes, would compensate for this loss. And it was, I think, okay until it, the, the, the uh, predation rate reaches a, a certain level. When predations are continuous and consistent, then there are other elements that come in into the scene. And one of them is the desperation and frustration of the livestock owners that in the morning they have to wake up with the idea of there is still the possibility that today I would find some of my, of my sheep killed. And this would throw him or her through a process that is really frustrating because it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of administration work, a lot of time wasted and little money compensated. So this feeds a lot of frustration. And no matter how much money you pay for a single head lost, the frustration will never go away. So this is what we were talking about during these meetings with stakeholders, you know, that, that compensation is important, but it's not the only mean of, of managing damages caused by wolf. So in general, um, wolf is a protected species in most European countries. In general, most European countries use compensation for wolf depredations. Few European countries also subsidize damage prevention measures. This is unfortunate. And some European countries also monitor the wolf population at regular time periods, not all of them. In some areas, like the Scandinavian countries, you have a perfect system of monitoring whereby each wolf has its own DNA and they have the pedigree of each single wolf. Whoa. And they know where they go, they, they know where they come from, they know where parent, where their parents are, they know where their siblings are. <laughs> it's an incredible system. Uh, there is a somehow participatory uh, system whereby, you know, through citizen science, people can report sightings of wolves and and the system works pretty well yet in those countries the wolf populations are very tiny mm, mm -hmm. less than 50 wolves in norway now 300 wolves in sweden and the parliament is pushing for halving the population you know some hundred wolves in in finland so in this in these areas, of course, it's much easier to do such a, a very detailed monitoring. In Italy, where in our first ever national survey, we estimated the presence of, you know, between 3,500 and 4,000 wolves, it's it would be impossible. It would be impossible. Can you imagine from less than 100 wolves in the early 70s to up? 4,000 wolves now. That's mind-blowing. 
Yeah. Isn't this species amazing? Yes. It has taken back every single space it could take. Yes. Wow. And I, there's just, it's, this species, again, is just so amazing and just awe-inspiring in every single way that you can possibly imagine. One, being able to repopulate like that after being completely decimated, and then to hear in some European countries where the habitat is prime for wolves to come back, they're numbers are going to be potentially halved and we've seen that a lot in the united states too that whoever is running a state because our states and european countries work pretty similarly in that sense so you know we have states that are making these really crazy claims that they want to completely decimate their populations down to the federal minimum and it sounds like some other countries are doing something similar. And then you have a country like Italy, where everybody across the world thinks of amazing wine and cheese and Rome and all of this stuff. And you have one a thriving wolf population. And I hope everybody just lets that sink in for a second. Upwards of 4,000 wolves in Italy blows my absolute mind. It's amazing. <laughs> So what do you see as then the future? Like as as you've gone through your work and you've probably seen trends come and go and you're watching what parliaments are doing in the EU and all of these things are going on at once and you're centered right in the middle of all of this. What do you think is going to happen in the future for Europe's wolves? Well, things I think have become more complicated than they were like 30 years ago because... We said it before, the um, social aspects of all these are, are, are very important. And we experienced the fact that despite the efforts that you invest in protecting a small population of, wolf, of wolves, there might suffice one or two people who don't like wolves that can just, you know, throw away all the efforts done because wolves are illegally killed in, in Italy, it, is, it must be said either through the use of poison or through the use of illegal traps that most often are placed there for other species, not for wolves. But, you know, a wolf that is caught by a snare that has been set up for, um, for wild boar might not be stopped because it, it is so strong that it might take the snare off and goes around with a snare either around his neck or around his belly and is deemed to die of an incredibly uh, suffering death. So yeah, wolves are shot as well during hunts for other species. And these are all reflections of some societal emotions that need to be taken into account. Okay, So this increases the complexity of the system. Why 30 years ago we, we just stated, okay, wolf is a protected species, we need to protect it, stop, okay, full stop. Now we need to let more elements to come into the system and say, okay, wolf, yes, it, it still is a protected species, but uh, can afford some control because, you know, its presence has some impacts. And, and these and these needs to to be dealt with, you know, at, at, at the societal level. There are politicians that make campaigns on wolf protections and wolf control. Uh, you know, they they seek for uh, votes through promise of opening to wolf hunt, which is amazing. Uh, I would have never thought of having to talk to politicians when I was, you know, uh, at the early at my early career would never have thought of uh, having to ask for a meeting with politicians. Yet it is, it is a very complex and very emotional driving process you know, that, that makes things more complex than, than we ever thought. So I think the future of wolves in Europe is positive. You know, the, 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 the trend is still increasing. 
um, most countries have their populations uh, at a good conservation status and they will keep them, although, you know, there, there might be some control needed because maybe not everybody wants to see wolves uh, out, out in the garden if they live <laughs> in the countryside. <laughs> I mean, that's true. <laughs> And I think to spin it on a more personal note, working with wolves, I'm sure, is an emotional roller coaster that you go on pretty much a daily basis. You said that you've become an expert at staying neutral, but sometimes I'm sure internally you don't always feel neutral. So why are you still here doing what you're doing? Well, if I look back, my my story my my life experience i i have a particular feeling with wilderness and 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 wild so i love i love wildlife i love being in 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 the wilderness you know when when i take even my children in the in the mountains for a walk i really love you know showing them all the small signs that can tell them more than what what they just see at a first glance, you know, tell stories of the animals, the stories of evolution, you know, with the, the little tricks that animals have evolved for survival. I think all this is fascinating. But I also I also feel that I belong to the to the human society. So the struggle here is to find a balance you know, between our place in in planet earth as as human society and and the quality of life that we want to live now and we want to 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 allow our future generations to live i think this is our responsibility so i very much feel you know i very much empathize with all the people that i talk to if i talk to a livestock breeder i i Feel you know after I talk with them, I thought, oh yes, he's really right. You know, I I, I do see his reason, and I talk to uh, an animal rights activist, and I thought, oh yes, I I quite understand his reason. I I really, you know, I feel that. So we need to find a balance between all these. And one thing that I really am strongly convinced about is that information is the key. Knowledge. You know, the, the, the deeper you know about things, the, the, the better you understand your place, you know, the better you understand the impact that you make. We have lost the connection to, to the things that we use and we eat. So if we know that the, what we use every day in our life has an impact, on the environment that we live and we want to continue living, I think we might be able to um, to find an equilibrium ourselves. That is an amazing why. <laughs> and that is a why that will definitely take you through the rest of your life if you keep that in front of you. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. Well, I'm sure that everyone listening is super grateful for you and your time and taking us through this incredible wolf life history in Europe. And if somebody wants to learn more and they might want to get a hold of you or maybe there's good resources online, what would you say is the best place for someone to learn more about this and maybe about your work specifically? And then if anybody does possibly want to connect with you, what is the best way that someone could get their hands on more info? Well, in order to learn more about large carnivores, you know, wolves, bears and lynx in Europe, you could certainly visit the Large Carnivore Initiative for Europe webpage, which is www.lcie.org. Uh, there you can find a lot of information, management plans, population estimates and trends, management approaches and so on. There are there is a, a good library with reports. Uh, so this is a very technical website for, for, for technical knowledge. 
the work we have done with the with the stakeholders is part of the um, regional stakeholder platforms, which is being promoted by the EU stakeholder platform. This is a more difficult URL, but you find it on the internet, is on the European Commission website. If you just look for EU stakeholder platform, you should be able to find it. And there is, you know, all the information about the meetings that we have held, the work that we have done in the different countries, reports of meetings and and the proposals that were elaborated by the different groups. I can be reached through email, but you can see my profile on LinkedIn, on ResearchGate. I don't have a personal web page. <laughs> I don't think I need one. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. And of course, I'll have all of those links in the show notes. I will look up that stakeholder platform and see if I can just easily put a link in there so anyone could just go to rewatology.com and go to this episode and, and check any of those links to easily click around and possibly learn more. And then, of course, your research gate profiles and all that stuff. I will always have all of that there. Wonderful, Valeria. Thank you again so much for sitting down with me and sharing your story with the whole Rewatology community. And then, of course, being a part of the uh, European Carnivore series. So again, thank you for your time. I really appreciate well, it. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you for getting in touch. Well, I'm still mulling over this conversation with Valeria. I wonder when politicians will get over themselves and work with experts like Valeria to create a proper wolf management plan. I also thought it was really interesting to hear Valeria, a wolf expert and enthusiast, express her support for the sustainable harvest of wolves in countries with thriving populations. Just like she said, the wolf isn't vulnerable anymore, especially in countries like Italy, which have almost 4,000 wolves. This showed me that Valeria truly understands both the wolf side of the conversation and the human dimension that comes along with it. I plan to keep in touch with Valeria and see if she has updates to share with you and me in the future. If you have a specific question you'd like to discuss about today's topic, head on over to the Rewildology YouTube channel and submit your question in the comments section of today's episode. Some of you have reached out and asked how you can support the show. Well, I'm happy to share that there are several ways to do so. Some zero cost ways to support the show include subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming app, leaving a rating and review to boost the algorithm, which will present the podcast to more listeners, signing up for the weekly Rewildology newsletter at rewildology.com, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and following the show on your favorite social media app. If you'd like to financially support the show and help us keep these stories on the airwaves, consider making a monetary donation at rewildology.com or purchase a piece of swag to show off your Rewildology love. At least 10% of proceeds from this podcast will be donated to our conservation partners. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Heather Valley, the show's audio and video producer, for making the show sound and look awesome, and Focusrite for powering the podcast sound. If you'd like to see the Focusrite gear we use to record the show, head on over to rewildology.com and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.